Hello, thank you for watching and welcome to this series devoted to applying conservative exegesis to biblical texts relevant to the topic of hell. Since hell is an English word and not Hebrew or Greek, and since it may or may not correspond to a variety of different Hebrew and Greek words, and especially since theology is not done best at a mere word level, this study will focus on answering a broader question. Instead of just asking which verses have the word hell in them and what do I think they mean, the question should be, what view emerges when one asks the question, what does the whole counsel of scripture say about what happens to the unrepentant, unredeemed wicked? After all, if you think of it, if one of the main messages of Christianity is that Jesus saves, then we should know what he saves us from. Well, welcome back to Every Verse on Hell. Today's focus will be eternal fire. What does that mean? Previously, we discussed unquenchable fire, which is similar. I think they're co-referential in terms of just the big picture of New Testament descriptions of judgment. Unquenchable fire, for the context of what that means, I would say go see the Isaiah video, Jeremiah video, or the Ezekiel video. Uh, it's employed in all those uh, books. And in that prophetic literature, unquenchable fire is fire that's unstoppable. I've given this analogy before, but... Um, an unstoppable tank is not a tank that is always in drive and moving forward. You could park an unstoppable tank. The semantic relationship between stopping or not stopping and then literally moving forward is more nuanced. And you could tell um, because in that prophetic literature, the unquenchable fire is not fire that was ever anticipated to be burning forever. It was a threat from God uh, to destroy the gates of Jerusalem or the forests around it or even temples, I'm sorry, um, palaces within it. So uh, you could tell that that's how the phrase is being used because of the context. And so when Christ refers to unquenchable fire and even does so in the context of alluding to that same body of literature, um, in my opinion, it, it makes sense to just convey that same meaning unless you have a reason otherwise. But, so instead of unquenchable fire, the focus today will be eternal fire. We're going to look at where it's used in the New Testament, and we're going to see what we can learn. The first one is in uh, Matthew 18, verse 8. So Christ says, If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Um... Goodness, can I just say it off the bat here? Uh, I have heard innumerable times that eternal fire must be fire that's always burning because it's eternal. And if it's an eternal fire that's always burning, it must always have fuel because fires need fuel. And if, and if a fire always has fuel, then those that it's burning must always endure. Therefore, if you're thrown into the eternal fire, you are physically being burnt, or I mean spiritually, I guess, but... Um, I would say that if you're just only spiritual in the afterlife, that's extreme dualism. Um, anyway, I don't know if that's a good label, but we're, there will be a physical resurrection. So anyway, if they're thrown into the eternal fire, that there's the sense in which they're just always on fire because it's eternal. The question is not what makes sense to people on earth based on earthly fire. The question should be what does scripture say about eternal fire? Because... Right off the bat, I can think of two examples of fire that doesn't exactly work like earthly fire. Um, the first would be the burning bush. Was the bush really fuel, or was it just on fire because of a miracle? And I would say the bush was on fire because of a miracle. It's not, it's not that the, the bush was fuel for it. Well, perhaps it was, perhaps it wasn't. It's not clear. Um, we also read in Deuteronomy, I think, 24, that God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? Is he fuel for himself? He is a consuming fire? Is this metaphor? Um, would it be appropriate to say that God is fuel for himself? And if so, what does that mean? In other words, I'm just trying to point out that in Scripture, it's not always the case that fire works the same way a campfire does here on earth. Okay, so here we are in Matthew 18, 8. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. It's not super descriptive of what, what's going to happen to them, but 
We know that there's a contrast here, at least. It's not life. Some will enter life. The others, presumably, will have not life. Matthew 25 is another place where we see eternal fire. Mm, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to, into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In this passage, we have eternal life and eternal punishment is both a parallel and a contrast. It's both. The parallel is in what appears to be the duration. Now, I, I would say some universalists claim that, and that they're right to say it, eternal, ionios, literalistically means of that age. Um, and so, but the, but the fact that they're together modifying uh, the two different extremes, so there's eternal life on the one hand, and eternal punishment basically expressed in the same breath. It would be weird if eternal life endures forever, but the punishment doesn't, if you're using the same word to modify them both, with no explanation for why. However, this is not just a parallel. It's a contrast, right? On the one hand, some get life. On the other, some don't. So it's, it's uh, paralleled probably in the duration of the effect, and a contrast in what happens. But again, neither one of these passages is really all that descriptive of what happens to those thrown into the eternal fire, as we see in 25.41 and 18.8. It just says that it'll happen. But there is another place in the New Testament that has the phrase eternal fire, and that's Jude 7. Um, Jude's so short there's no chapters, it's just verses. So Jude 7 says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So here we go. This is much more descriptive. In fact, it's extremely descriptive. We know exactly what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities from Genesis. They serve as an example of undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So, What's going to happen to you if you undergo a punishment of eternal fire? Well, here's an example. Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another place that sort of confirms this logic. But before I go there, I want to point out that the Old Testament repeatedly brings up the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah as a place that didn't burn forever, but was completely wiped out and destroyed, as you see in Deuteronomy 29, Isaiah 13, Jeremiah 50, Lamentations 4, and Zephaniah 2. Sodom and Gomorrah are not still on fire today. They were not still on fire in the time of Christ. They weren't even really on fire all that long. What happened, though, was that it was an eternal fire from heaven, rained down on them, and wiped out those cities to utter destruction. And the, the rest of the scriptures that bring up that event don't bring it up as though it's still on fire. They bring it up as though it's a desolation, a wilderness, a haunt of jackals kind of a thing. So we see another confirmation of this logic from 2 Peter 2, verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So 2 Peter 2, 6 and Jude 7 are in pretty close parallel, which makes sense because both of those letters are in parallel. What's going to happen to those that suffer a punishment of eternal fire? Well, here's an example, Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were wiped out completely. And they, those cities were turned into a desolation with no survivors. Now it's like a wilderness area. What's going to happen to the ungodly? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes and condemned to extinction. So that's pretty vivid. And the, so this Jude 7 is the only other place where we see eternal fire outside of Matthew and the, the times that's used in Matthew are not super descriptive, but Jude 7 and 2 Peter 2 are extraordinarily descriptive. Uh, just as a side note, 2 Peter 2, 6 says that they were condemned to extinction. The Greek word there is catastrophe. I think that's where we get our word catastrophe. It's a pretty safe assumption there. 
In 2 Peter 2, um, we see the only other time the New Testament uses the word catastrophe um, as a, a reference to the fact that um, people who are quarreling about words um, are just going to ruin themselves. And I would say that's a metaphorical use of the word catastrophe. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, but there is a use of that same word in 1 Clement 57, verse 4, which is helpful because it's also Greek. It's, it's sort of like contemporaneous with the New Testament-ish, and it was highly regarded by the early church. Um, and it's a reference to people being destroyed. But, you know, you don't really need those linguistic comparisons because 2 Peter 2.6 is about an event that we all know about. Like Sodom and Gomorrah were turned to ashes. That's what it meant for them to be condemned to extinction. Okay, so now we're going to move on um, to a different study. The study now is going to focus on just the modifier eternal. What does it mean when the New Testament uses the word eternal? Uh, we have an example here in Mark 3, 29. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Well, in judgment, how long are those people who were saying he has an unclean spirit going to keep saying he has an unclean spirit? I think eventually they're going to know every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So they're not going to be eternally blaspheming the Holy Spirit in that regard. But then you could still come back and say, well, but they'll be sinners through and through, and so they'll be blasphemers through and through. But it seems to me, from the New Testament perspective of judgment, and from the perspective of this verse, that the eternal sin is not necessarily to be understood as a sin that they do over and over again forever without ceasing, but it's a sin that has an eternal consequence. What's the eternal consequence? never has forgiveness. So by the context of this verse, and from my understanding of judgment as a whole, big picture, um, this sin is going to have an eternal consequence, and it's not necessary for me to conclude that they are constantly doing that sin, although that's not off the table altogether. Um, we're going to continue looking at how the word eternal modifies other things besides life and punishment. In Hebrews 5.9, we see, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That salvation that Christ brings, it has an enduring effect. But the act of saving was once for all. So Christ on the cross, Christ on the cross, his burial and his resurrection are all past tense. Those all happened. So he secured salvation once for all. He's not still dying for us, right? But the salvation is secured with an eternal effect. So the act of saving was an, an event, not still happening. But the enduring effect of it is eternal. Uh, we see something very similar here in 6, 1 and 2. Um, we're going to leave behind the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And of verse 2, instruction about washings and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are some of the things that... Um, He's making reference to, but okay, anyway, the word eternal is modifying judgment. And it also seems to me, big picture, that we, we should not conclude that God is going to have a day of judgment, and then the next day is a day of judgment, and then there's another day of ju judgment, and that continuously throughout the eschaton and throughout all time, he's entering into judgment. It's not that the judging is constant. It's that there was a judgment with eternal consequences. And so again, we see the word eternal not implying necessarily that the action must be continuous, but that it has an eternal effect, or at least an effect that is of perta or pertaining to that age, which is a more literalistic definition of what eternal would mean, of or pertaining to that age. Uh, we see a really clear example, in my opinion, in Hebrews 9, verse 12, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. I could be wrong, but I feel that, theologically speaking, it would be an error, and a grave one at that, to, to, to say that because redemption is modified by the word eternal, that Christ must be, therefore, redeeming us over and over and over again. No, in my, in, in my understanding, Christ died once for sins. He was put to death in the flesh. He was buried, and he has risen, ascended to heaven, right? The sacrifice is not continuous. In fact, that would go against the grain of everything the, <laughs> the book of Hebrews is trying to tell you. He doesn't have to keep doing it over and over again. The, the, that's why he's a superior high priest. 
So like literally the whole point of Hebrews would be undercut by a poor definition of eternal in this phrase, eternal redemption, if you took it to mean that he has to be continually redeeming you. That would be like a concept of attainment failure of the highest order from the book of Hebrews. Okay, so now what we're going to look at is, what does it mean that it's an eternal fire, or alternatively, an eternal punishment? Eternal fire is fire that could be always burning, although Jude 7 makes it clear that Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of eternal fire as a punishment, and those verses I showed you from the Old Testament, those show that from the Old Testament's perspective, Sodom and Gomorrah are not on fire. They are, in fact, a desolation wasteland, not burning. So I would say that first definition is probably not a good one because that's not how Jude 7 used it, and Matthew 18 and Matthew 25 are ambiguous. So in my opinion, I would say, let's lean on what's not ambiguous, that is, Jude 7 and 2 Peter 2.6. But eternal fire could be fire that destroys utterly and completely, which is how Jude 7 uses it. It could also be fire that has some eschatological character, if we were to just do a wooden translation. And I think that's a valid translation. Some kind of fire with an eschatological character to it. Or lastly, but not least, fire that comes from the eternal God, who is himself a consuming fire, as I mentioned earlier from Deuteronomy, I think it's 24. In my opinion, Definition 2, 3, and 4 here could all be true at the same time. I don't believe that the first one makes any sense at all of Jude 7. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't be used in Matthew 18 and Matthew 25, but these same arguments work with eternal punishment. It could be a punishment that's always ongoing, or it could be a punishment that has an eternal effect, or it could be a punishment of that eschatological character, right? And I wouldn't say a punishment that comes from God is must be, well, that one would be... <laughs> If you're smarter than I am, you can work out the fourth definition with the word punishment. But anyway, um, the, when we looked at Mark and Hebrews to see how the word eternal modifies other nouns, especially nouns of action, it's clear to me that it's usually not an action that must by necessity happen over and over again, but is instead an action that has an eternal consequence. So uh, an eternal fire and an eternal punishment, the most likely way to see these in the context of what we've seen so far is a, a punishment and a fire that has an effect that lasts forever. Some people say, well, since Jude 7 says they currently serve as an example, they must be still burning because this is in the present tense. Now, I would say this is a very bad syllogism. Like, you say, this is in the present tense. That's plank one. Plank two, present tense things are happening right now. Therefore, Sodom and Gomorrah are still on fire. Like that, that's bad logic. And I can show you why it's bad logic, but I'm going to show you that there's other places where that verb is used. Um, this one's not a super good example because it says that the hope is set before us. Same verb, same uh, tense, present tense. But the hope that is set before us is always going to be set before us before eternity, right? As long as um, there are people on this earth and God has not entered into judgment yet, like that hope is still set before us. So yeah, that one's always there. But if you go to Josephus in the Jewish War, which is written, this is Greek, and it has the same verb, and let me just show you real quick. I have the Penguin Classics version, and uh, I'm on page 345. And um, it says, Do you think you can count on God, whom you have denied his everlasting worship, to be your ally in the war? And do you blame your own sins on the Romans, who have throughout respected our law and are now pressing you to restore to God the sacrifices which you have interrupted? But consider John. To turn your back on evil ways is no disgrace, even at the last moment. So he's saying, don't be embarrassed to change your mind if you're doing the right thing. If you wish to save your birthplace, you have a splendid example before you. So that's the verb right there, present tense. In Jehoiakim, king of the Jews, when the king of Babylon made war on him through his own fault, he left the city of his own accord before its capture. Okay, at the time of this dialogue, Jehoiakim was long dead. So, but he's using the present tense verb of said, said before you as an example. So doesn't that must, the, present tense, present tense things are happening right now. Therefore, Jehoiakim is still king of the Jews in Babylon. No, 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 that's craziness. Something can happen in the past. And you could say it currently is an example right now in the present tense because you can literally still learn from it. Sodom and Gomorrah are still an example. 
of what a punishment of eternal fire is, because you can still learn from it. There's no, mean, there's no sense at all in saying that they must still be on fire right now because they still serve as an example. I could say to you, you know, William Shakespeare writes in the book of Hamlet about this blah, 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 and you'd be like, wait, hold on a second. Shakespeare's dead. He's not still writing. And I would say, no, no, that's not how language works. Language is elastic. Um, the present tense is elastic. That's not how the present tense works. So anyway, we saw three phrases of eternal fire in the New Testament. One was Matthew 18, 8, where people are thrown into the eternal fire um, instead of entering into life. We see that uh, what happens to people who suffer eternal fire um, looks like Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is that they were condemned to extinction. Um, and that's what's going to happen to the ungodly. And then um, we looked at how the word eternal modifies nouns. And so... It could be, I think it's most likely the case that when we see eternal punishment, it's a punishment that has an eternal effect. Not, not that God's constantly entering into judgment over and over and over again, but that there's a judgment, right, has, a, has an eternal effect. Just like that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're still doing it over and over and over again, always, but that had an eternal effect. There's a, this, there, eternal redemption. It's not a redemption that Christ is doing over and over and over again because that flies in the face of what Hebrews is saying. It's a redemption that happened with an eternal effect. So when you're thrown into the eternal fire, it's an eternal punishment. What happens to you has an eternal effect. In other words, it cannot be undone. Just like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were laid waste, could not be undone. They couldn't stop it. It was an eternal fire of punishment. And that is what's going to happen to the ungodly. I appreciate you watching. And um, next time we're going to do more from the Gospels about life versus destruction. We're going to do a separate one for the Gospel of John and for the book of Revelation and also for Paul's work. Um, but we'll catch you next time for those. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.